comment just shuts it right down <laughs> so i'm like i'm not gonna sit here and play those games but yeah i've been noticing in the last six weeks a higher incidence weekly it's been yeah. happening for about a year here and there and it always has with me yeah, yeah um, it always it always has and um it's but it's interesting uh let's someone see. someone asked me well don't you get pissed off when people steal your work i said no i'm honored if, if someone's going to break the law to get my work that means it's that much better it's like well, actually, they're not breaking the law. They're just no, che- they're just copying. Yeah, and, and they can only take it so far because they're not going to really grok what I. Yeah, they, they the can't fill, figure out what we're doing. And I, I actually, I actually found some sort of event that's this month, but it's online. I think that um, is trying to copy the idea of the confluence. Mm. <laughs> so good evening susan nice to see you tomorrow this evening hey, uh, susan. and uh I, yeah it's been i actually, hope you know the schedule <laughs> yeah mo- multiple ahead. times daily i mean it's it's all the, so now part of me is like well i'm gonna just start putting out a little bit faulty stuff here and there to see how misled it is how easy it is to <laughs> mislead them <laughs> Uh, just let them do it. You know, a, a, a rising tide raises all ships. Well, yeah, and and, um, and you know, my concern years ago when I got into this in earnest with ArchetypeInAction.com, uh, that was in 2010. My concern was that you know nobody was really talking about this stuff. And now it's becoming more common to talk about it. Right. And and, um, I think that that's a good thing. It's a healthy thing. Uh, It's getting it out into the community. You know, God knows I know that that I can do something uh, very small and it can have big effect. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, well, like T.S. Eliot said, you know, good poets borrow, but great poets steal. Because if they make it, if they make it their own, I'm like, cool. I can watch how they take it. And um, interestingly yeah. enough, you know, we talk about on Wednesdays, you know, reading out the gender, so it's not all he he he, mm-hmm. and you know, it's not so much just substituting to her, but you know, person instead of his his yeah. kind of thing. Well, I was talking with Mary Greer recently, <clears throat> and I mentioned that. Um, I was doing that. And she said, I noticed you're doing a lot of she's like gratuitously, like seeing if people will notice. And she said, I notice. So what are you doing? I said, well, there's a movement really to get rid of anima and animus, anima and animus in a way to modernize. And she said, oh, you know what I started calling it? And I'm like, what's that? She goes, animal, like A-N-I-M-A-U-S, like dead ma, great mother, spirit mother in a way, but that's not gendered. It's more like Gaia. So mm-hmm. the M-A-U-S, and I went, hmm. So well, let that settle in for a little while. Well, I do think it's different. Um, and, mm-hmm. you know, for men and women. And, um, you know, as I've been studying this stuff, I have been noticing that some of the distinctions that uh, Jung makes between men and women uh, I have been noticing more that I didn't notice before, before mm-hmm. I was studying. Uh, one example is that women are closer to nature. And I've been noticing this for a decade now. But uh, for example, um, we have a, a cam on the Chesapeake Bay Foundation website that is watching an osprey nest. And nice. uh, <clears throat> my wife and her mother are just wow into it and you know i was watching it with interest it's interesting to learn what happens and uh i um you know especially in the life cycle of birds because this time of year they develop very fast and and go into adulthood almost instantly right 
And uh, so it's interesting to watch what's happening and also to see the parallels with ourselves. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the Asprey is interesting because they do three things. The, the, um, the male comes back and he stakes out the nest. They, they mate for life or for as long as the other is around, but they separate half of the year and more than half of the year and they um but when it's mating time uh the male comes about the about uh saint patrick's day and he just sits on the same nest they set on last year now he's flown meanwhile ten thousand miles down to brazil right. down to brazil and back but he goes to the exact same nest and if, if any uh, interlopers show up, he chases them away, including mm -hmm. you know, juvenile females, for example. And, but then when his mate shows up, um, he does three things. He uh, does a sky dance to show that he is still healthy and is a strong mate. Um, and in fact, this is how they all mate, even if they haven't been going a long time. The male does a sky dance. Then um, he brings a fish. Uh, and that proves that when the female is sitting on the eggs for 40 days, mm -hmm. um, she won't starve to death. And then the third thing is he builds a nest. I mean, the next thing he does is build a nest with the help of the female. And, um, you know, they build the nest in a couple weeks time. She uh, is just like a, like a woman in a new house. She, if she doesn't like a stick that he brings in, she throws it over the side. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, uh, and then she gets it all comfy for herself and then they mate and mm -hmm. you know not too long after that eggs start to appear in the nest and then it's a 40-day uh, siege where she has to sit on the eggs for 40 days he comes in every so often um and uh oh, let's see it was interesting i watched last night i watched a documentary um called octopus volcano and it's that they wondered if octopus or octopi could hear um, infrasound, like mm -hmm. between one, one and four kilohertz, which is below our level of hearing. Because every time um, the uh, volcano on, um, what's the island in the middle of the Mediterranean? Um, hmm, I didn't take notes. Um, anyway, it's gone off like every 20 minutes for 2000 years. It's the most wow. active volcano on the in the world. It's not huge, but um, it's the Romans even called it the the Roman the Mediterranean lighthouse because it was going off so frequently. But the octopus thrive there, and they don't get you know crabs get rolled over by rocks, lobsters get rolled over by rocks that are spit out of the volcano and roll down the hills underwater, and the octopuses don't. And they notice too, the octopi, octopi are, are out like, you know, a thousand, fifteen hundred feet, maybe even more away from the volcano, just in time it erupts and then they come back. And Ooh. so they, they were doing tests of, is it sound, is it motion, or is it this low frequency uh, infra sound? And it was that because that they put them in a dark aquarium so they couldn't see motion or, or light. And evidently they can't see infrared so they could film them. Um, mm -hmm. But they then would do the uh, one to four kilohertz, the infrasound and the octopi would try to move over to the corner or, you know, get away ish from wherever they were and mm -hmm. from the, the sound source, which mm -hmm. was interesting like the Osprey. I mean, there's this, just this natural cyclical rhythm that they live by, you know? Right, right. And, and so they, then about this time of year, the eggs are hatching and right. then the parents spend one month, approximately one month 
uh, growing the babies up to full size. And um, the father is in charge of um, teaching them to fish. And, you know, you know, this is what I do, you know, watch me. Right? And mm-hmm. this, is how you, this is how you get these fishies. And, uh, and then um, about the 1st of August, the uh, female says, bye, see you next year. Yeah. And, and she heads out uh, for, for Brazil and they don't see each other for nine months, but then the next right. year they're back there again, almost on the same date every year. Uh, but nice. the reason I mentioned the Osprey ever is because, you know, we're like that too. We're, um, the reason the custom of the, the male taking the woman out to dinner is to, show the woman that he can feed her and right. take care of her when um when she has her babies and naturally women like that <laughs> you know if they're gonna have somebody's children um and so um anyway susan says i don't have video yet okay i don't know why you don't have video. I am seeing video on the YouTube channel and Jordan and I can uh, hear one another. So I wonder if it's that delay, that YouTube delay. Oh, here she comes. She's coming on to Zoom. So maybe I can help her here. Um, Okay, so, all right. So Susan, I'm gonna give you an allow to talk permission. And on the chat, you can send me messages if you like. Uh, you don't have to speak if you don't want to, but um, if, uh, if you go over to the chat, uh, you can um, send me a message here and tell me whether you can hear me. Um, I hope so. Okay. So, Good to have uh, you here, Susan. Yeah. Uh, Okay, she says she can hear now. Okay, wonderful, perfect. Okay, um, and I am watching both chats, Susan, so we'll be res- res- responsive to both if you want to comment. Now there's a, a user called Anton do- Does Music, and he says, thank you for continuing to do this. I, re- I really enjoy you guys discuss this book as you walk through it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we need. Yeah, that. that's an honor. <laughs> this was this was uh, you know those kind of accolades are few and far between. Mm-hmm. And before we came online this evening, Jordan and I were talking about the fact that how all these Jungian analysts are now copying what I've been doing for the last um, well, really for the last uh, twelve years, but on the YouTube channel for the last six, except where I give my uh, work away, essentially. Um, They are trying to turn it into a a course that they can sell to somebody. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so I wish them luck with that, but um, I don't do it in order to make money. I do it for my, soul satisfaction Mm -hmm. and um which brings me which brings up one other thing that i would like to show folks which is uh one of the things i decided to do for our confluence which is coming up in um just over two weeks is that i decided to make um bookmarks for everyone and every bookmark will be different Um, and I'm going to let everyone randomly take a bookmark and I'm just going to put the link here onto the YouTube chat in case you don't know what I'm talking about. You can go to that YouTube site. Oh, this is going to be, um, this is going to be June 10th to the 13th. Now, next week we'll be the last Monday night we will do for about three weeks or 
at least two weeks. Uh, let's see, Monday, you know, for three weeks. So we, we will be down on the Monday night regular 8 p.m. session. However, we are going to broadcast the Confluence. This is a big announcement now. We are going to broadcast the Confluence um, live on this YouTube channel and also on Tim Holmes' YouTube channel. So in case you want to get another camera view or in case my uh, iPhone grabs out, uh, you could always go over to Tim's thing. But what I decided to do was to do um, uh, a series of sentences that actually make up chapter two of, um, of the Red Book. And so, and I decided to put them on a, um, on a bookmark. So here's the, the first one, or one of the first ones. Nice. Um, and I'm going to put a, a ribbon on one end of it. And uh, so on the front, the quote is, this life is the way, the long sought after to the unfathomable, which we call divine. So this is an important point in Jungian psychology in that, um, that the only way there is, is through your life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you, if you're going to make something out of it, it's up to you to do that. And if you don't make anything out of it, then don't don't expect to wake up playing a harp in heaven <laughs> right. because it's pretty clear even in even in biblical passages it's now being come be, becoming more and more clear to me that even the ancients knew that heaven is in the psyche there's no mm -hmm. heaven up there okay the only heaven is right here and you know, you're, you're going to leave whatever you leave has, has to be done in this life, right? And, and so your spirit will continue on as Jordan's and mine will because people like this. So therefore, um, therefore, I imagine YouTube will keep these videos playing as, <laughs> as long as they're getting hits on them forever. <laughs> Well, and I have to say thank you, especially um, for that accolade for the word continue to, because that means, you know, this is some someone out there who's who stops in occasionally, not just, yeah. you know, one time. And I think that that's a, even makes it a larger compliment, a larger accolade to me that there's a the continuance piece is that someone's, you know, found it of interest enough to come stop by when they do which I, I thoroughly appreciate. So thank you. So anyway, the, um, what, the other thing that we're doing here, I don't know what have I done? But on, on this bookmark thingy, uh, I'm giving them away as Chotsky to the people who come to the confluence. So uh, you won't be able to share that if you're watching, uh, on the live YouTube, but over that weekend, 10th to 13th of June, uh, there's going to be a lot of live streams and, um, and you'll be able to see a lot of what we're doing there. Um, now on the back of the bookmark, uh, it says, uh, the creators are at Helena, Montana, the red book by young folio 232 Reader's Edition 128. So it says where the quote is from, and then it's got the dates on it. So, you know, the idea is to give somebody something that every time they look at it, they're going to remember this numinous weekend that they had in Helena mm -hmm. one time. Um, and, um, and so anyway, um, okay, so Zen Mode says, uh, I hope he makes a bookmark with the contents of the seven sermons of the dead. Well, it will certainly be, if I do that, it'll be certainly more than one bookmark. And I am considering making them as a product 
uh, as a unique product, which only you would have. Um, and uh, but they look pretty nice, huh? Yeah, I like the black and the, the gold. Yeah, black right. and the gold. And uh, so yeah, that's worked out pretty well. I got a. Oh, the black and gold's great because you get the you get the negretto and the void and the unconscious, and then you get the everything raw, prima materia made into gold. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good evening, Justin. Um, and so anyway, this is this is how I'm doing it. I spent all day today doing this. Uh, but, well, nice. I'll just, I'll just un cloak for a moment here um, so people can see these but I, I'm doing it on sheets like this diff the different things and if I flub like I did here I just go on and do it again mm -hmm. uh, and uh, but the, the one that I think is cool is uh, I, I, I've been hoping to start doing calligraphy that has um, illuminations, you know, pictures, little pictures in it. Mm -hmm. And so uh, this, this is the quote, and I, I've got the, I'll show you the illumination. Um, My friends, it is wise to nourish the soul. Otherwise, you will breed dragons and devils in your heart. And I don't know if you can see this, but mm -hmm. here's my devil. And oh, nice. Uh, let's see, where's the dragon? Dragon. Here's a dragon coming out of this word and the heart. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because I decided on my architectural well being book that I'm working on um, to do it illustrated, hand done, and do this. Mm -hmm. and do a one big back, but a, a double folio. Cool. Good idea. Out of leather. And I haven't made a book in. 15 years, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, I did one years back. Well, those will be valuable. And um, anyway, we, we do have a bookmaking session at the Confluence. Yeah, Sherry. However, um, you and I are not going to participate in it because we're, we're the alternative. We're doing the truth <laughs> that day. <laughs> um, but anyway, whatever. Um, we, we are making a documentary about this confluence and um, we hope to enter it into some film contests, actually film, yeah, film festivals. And, um, you know, depending on how that goes, we'll see. But the idea is that some of these teachings will be available mm. online and in the documentary as we go forward. Um, so Zen Mode says uh, that there is no heaven in the Old Testament, only the New Testament. Okay, I didn't know that. And good evening, Justin. And that's important. The, and then he says those bookmarks will be worth a fortune a few decades from now. Skip this treasure. Okay, well, let's hope. <laughs> yeah, if they're a treasure to someone, um, uh, so be it. Um, I do, you know, I do have to put a fair amount of time into each one of them. So, um, all right. So we're on page 182 of this book of, of about uh, 300 pages. Uh, there's some very interesting uh, passages later because as I was doing my bookmark work, I came across... Um, came across one um, footnote to, um, ah, here it is, to this book. And I'll just read the footnote because it's not in the red book. It's, it's a footnote, but uh, here's what Sham Dasani says. In 1912, Jung argued that scholarly, scholarliness was insufficient if one wanted to become a knower of the human soul. To do this, one had to hang up exact science and put away the scholar's gown to say far farewell to his study 
and wander with human heart um, uh, through the world, through the horror of prisons, madhouses, hospitals, uh, through drab suburban pubs to bro in brothels and gambling dens, through the salons of elegant society, uh, the stock exchanges, the socialist meetings, the churches, the revivals and ecstasies of the sex to experience love, hate, and passion in every form in one's body. Okay, so that's the only way that you're going to find your soul. And that's paragraph Well, and four. that takes the experiential, which is the head and the heart together. I mean, right. that's, that's a really important piece that... Um, now, interestingly, the, the footnote says that's... Uh, Section 409, but paragraph 409, wait a minute. Where is paragraph 409? Here it is. It's in the appendix, apparently. Appendix, yeah. I'll read the entire thing um, since it's here. Um, so this is paragraph 409 of two essays on analytical psychology. And I am reading it because I came across a footnote in the Red Book that refers to it. So here is paragraph 409. It's a page long. If he wants to help his patient, the doctor and above all the specialists for nervous diseases must have psychological knowledge for nervous disorders and all that is embraced by the terms nervousness, hysteria, etc., are of psychic origin and therefore logically require psychic treatment. Cold water, light, fresh air, electricity, and so forth have at best a transitory effect, and sometimes none at all. Often they are disreputable artifices calculated to work upon suggestibility. But the patient is sick in the mind, in the highest and most complex of the mind's functions, and these can hardly be said to belong any more to the province of medicine. Here, the doctor must also be a psychologist, which means that he must have knowledge of the human psyche. The doctor cannot evade this demand, so he naturally turns for help to psychology since his psychiatry textbooks have nothing to offer him. The experimental psychology of today, however, does not even begin to give him any coherent insight into what are practically the most important psychic processes. And uh, by that, I think he must be re referring to B.F. Skinner and people like that who were trying to figure out how you would react to something, but weren't examining what's really in your noggin. Well, okay. and especially B.F. Skinner was behaviorist extraordinaire. And I always joke that that's just mathematical form multiplication tables of things you might do you know if this then that if and only if this then that and that kind of logic is it's not just black and white it's it's like a list will tell you more about the person who made the list than the substance of what's on the list right. and you know it's that kind of thing Right. Okay. So I'm going to go back and read that sentence again and then carry on. The experimental psychology of today, however, does not even begin to give him any coherent insight into what are practically the most important psychic processes. That is not its aim. It tries to isolate the very simplest and most elementary processes, which border on physiology and studies them in isolation. It is ill disposed toward the infinite variety and mobility of individual psychic life. And for this reason, its findings and its facts are so, are so many details lacking organic cohesion. Therefore, anyone who wants to know the human psyche will learn next to nothing from experimental psychology. Uh, he would be better advised to abandon exact science put away his scholar's gown, bid farewell to his study, and wander with human heart through the world. There in the horrors of prisons, lunatic asylums, and hospitals, 
in drab suburban pubs and brothels and gambling hells, in the salons of the elegant, the stock exchange, socialist meetings, churches, revivalist gatherings, and ecstatic sex, through love and hate, through the experience of passion in every form in his body, his own body, he would reap richer stores of knowledge than textbooks a foot thick could give him. And he will know how to doctor the sick with real knowledge of the human soul. He may be pardoned if his respect for the so-called cornerstones of experimental psychology is no longer excessive. Um, for between what science calls psychology and what the practical needs of daily life demand from psych psychology, there is a great gulf fixed. Okay, so mm -hmm. um, nothing has changed since this was written a hundred years ago. Well, you know, in the cold water, light, fresh air, electricity, and so forth, having a transitory effect. I always use the example of a gardener who goes in and sniffs off all the weeds at the ground, but doesn't pull them, and then goes back and sits down with their, their tea in their chair and admires their handiwork, and, oh, look at my beautiful garden. And then, of course, two weeks later, the taproot being now even stronger because it, it was cut, which sends the energy to the roots. Two weeks later, they're all back up, and it's worse. So they're, you know, they're, they're like weeds. And mm -hmm. and that since the transitory piece, you've got to you've got to heal them and get them out. Absolutely. OK. So I'm, I'm having fun in the back of my mind running um, how I would sell these bookmarks. And I could I could sell them for 10 bucks a piece where you send in your ten dollars and I send you one randomly. And that's your synchronistic book bookmark. Or you can special order one for $50. <laughs> that, that's my rational entrepreneur's mind cooking in the background. I apologize for that. No, no. Are you going to do them all by hand or are you going to get a print on demand service? Oh, no, no. I'm going to do them all by hand. They have okay. to be done by hand in order to be authentic. Okay. Uh, you know, other, otherwise, I'm just copying the book, which uh, doesn't doesn't really work um oh, and thank you Susan for your, your comment on the the metaphor uh, of the gardener yeah okay and actually it's Jordan Jason has Argonauts and I don't so <laughs> <laughs> it's it's so common I have to say so actually thanks for the laugh no, right. no I appreciate the, the compliment there right oh Jason has golden fleece and Jordan's yeah. not, not about fleece at all. And I just have golden fleas. It's like sure. <laughs> so meanwhile, I did I did get some nice um, uh, actors makeup to put into my mustache oh, so that I can make my mustache and eyebrows uh, whiter for the play. And uh, that's so far, it worked out okay. We'll see how it does. We are going to broadcast the play, um, if we as as it works, depending on Wi-Fi and all that junk. Uh, mm -hmm. we're, we're certainly going to video record it. Um, but if we're successful in broadcasting it live, then it will be broadcast at uh, nine thirty p.m. Eastern Daylight Time on the twelfth of June. Okay, that's the time the play will be performed um, and you'll see whether I am fairly okay as a as an amateur art um, actor <laughs> make no they'll be fine you'll be fine yeah um, well I have done some acting in high school but I haven't done a play in 58 years so uh, this will be a, after a long hiatus. Just okay. bring some real life to it instead of some some acting, you know. Right. So, so anyway, um, we're going to go to paragraph two eighty seven, which we read last week as the yeah, last segue back in. Right. Yeah. So here's where I will read. 
Elsewhere, I have described a dream that illustrates the compensation of a religious problem in a young theological student. <clears throat> he was... Oh, wait a minute. It's an archetypes of the collective. And I probably ought to read that. It, it's in volume nine, one paragraph 71. Just give me a second. It's within reach if I stand up. Um, or maybe not. <laughs> no, there it is. It's not in order tonight. Pull it. All right. Archetypes of the collective unconscious. Uh, and so he's referring to this dream. So I guess we better read the dream. Um, and it's paragraph 71. Seventy one. Okay, here's 71. Okay, this is, this is about uh, the, the white and the black magician. And here comes Brendan, good. Which goes into, yeah, which goes into where we were um, the par in 287, paragraph 287 also. Yeah, well, I'll read the rest, this would be a rest good of that paragraph, but, but I think uh, people need to know what the dream was that's being referred to, so I'll provide that here. Okay, so this is uh, paragraph 71 of The Archetypes of the Collective Unconscious by C.G. Young. It's volume 9.1 of the collected works, uh, collected works. Good evening, Brendan, nice to see you. And you too, yeah. Skip and Jordan. Okay, Good to see so, you, Brendan. So I'm gonna read a theological dream, so you're right in, on time. Uh, Excellent tie, that's really rich. Yes, indeed. Okay, going on. He was standing in the presence of, so this is a young theological student and he's had this dream and here's what the dream was. He was standing in the presence of a handsome old man dressed entirely in black. He knew it was the white ma magician. This personage had just addressed him in considerable length, but the dreamer could not no longer remember what it was about. He had only retained the closing words, quote, and for this, we need the help of the black ma magician, unquote. At that moment, the door opened and it came in came another old man, exactly like the first, except that he was dressed in white. He said to the white magician, quote, I need your advice, unquote. But through a sidelong questioning look at the dreamer, whereupon the white magician answered, quote, you can speak freely, he is an innocent, unquote. The black magician then began to relate his story. He had come from a distant land where something extraordinary had happened. The country was ruled by an old king who felt his death near. He, the king, had sought out a tomb for himself, for there were in that land a great number of tombs, from ancient times, and the king had chosen the finest for himself. According to legend, a virgin had been buried in it. The king caused the tomb to be opened in order to get it ready for use. But when the bones it contained were exposed to the light of day, they suddenly took on life and changed into a black horse, which at once fled into the desert and there vanished. The black magician had heard this story and immediately set forth in pursuit of the horse. After a journey of many days, always on the tracks of the horse, he came to the desert and crossed to the other side where the grasslands began to again. There he met the horse grazing and there also he came upon the find on whose account he now needed the advice of the white magician for he had found the lost keys of paradise, and he did not know what to do with them. At this, ex 
at this exciting moment, the dreamer awoke. Okay. So he found the keys of paradise. <laughs> well, it's interesting because the, with the white magician and the black magician, it reminds me of the old story of um, the man of the trickster hat. And it's the short of it is that there's a man who walks between these two different fields. One's owned by one, this people, these people, and one's owned by this other tribe over here. And one day they actually meet in the middle of the road after he passes. And the one on the right says, you know, it's just such a regal black hat that that man wears every day. So crisp, so clean. And the other said, uh, what tomfoolery? I don't know what you're talking about. It's, it's the most exquisite white hat I've ever seen. And they, they both kind of grimace and are disrespectful to each other a little bit, but go back to their work. Well, the, the man walks by the next day. The same two guys come out to the road. See, I told you it's a white hat. See, I told you it's a black hat. Mm -hmm. And will they come to blows? So the police come out and take them into court. And um, the judge comes in and listens to both of their cases about how, you know, one is so sure that it's a black hat and one is so sure that it's a white hat. And the judge says, this man is my brother. He shall now come in. And he walks in. Well, every time the guy went to turn to wave, he held his hat. So it never moved, he held his hat, never moved. When he comes in, half of it's black and half of it's white. <laughs> and the judge says the moral here is don't sit on your crunchy old laurels that you are so correct and think that whatever you see gives you the whole picture because there's always another perspective. So, but that kind of is the, what's the guy asking now for the white magician? Cause he doesn't know what to do with these keys. Right. Okay. So now I'll go back to two essays and what it says. But anyway, the foot the footnote is what we just read, which was the story of the white and black magician. Paragraph 287. Elsewhere I have described a dream that illustrates the compensation of a religious problem in a young theological student. It was involved in all sorts of difficulties of belief, a not uncommon occurrence in the man of today. In his dream, he was the pupil of the white magician, who, however, was dressed in black. After having instructed him up to, this, to a certain point, the white magician told him that now they now needed the black magician. The black magician appeared, but clad in a white robe. He declared that he had found the keys of paradise, but needed the wisdom of the white magician in order to understand how to use them. This dream obviously contains the problem of opposites, which, as we know, has, has found in Dallas philosophy a solution very difficult, different from the views prevailing in the West. The figures employed by the dreams are impersonal collective images corresponding to the nature of the impersonal religious problem. In contrast to the Christian view, the dream stresses the relativity of good and evil in a way that immediately calls to mind the Taoist symbol of yin and yang. Paragraph 288. We should certainly not conclude from these compensations that as the conscious mind becomes more deeply engrossed in universal problems, the unconscious will bring forth correspondingly far-reaching compensations. There is what one might call a legitimate or an illegitimate interest in the impersonal problems. Excursions of this kind are legitimate only when they arise from the deepest and truest needs of the individual illegitimate when they are either mere intellectual curiosity or a flight from unpleasant reality. In the latter case, the unconscious produces all too human and purely personal compensations whose manifest aim is to bring the conscious mind back to ordinary reality. People who go illegitimately mooning after the, the infinite often have absurdly banal dreams which endeavor to damp down their 
ebullience. Thus, from the nature of the compensation, we can at once draw conclusions as to the seriousness and rightness of the conscious strivings. Okay, any comments? Yeah, there's the, the pendulum of balance there that, you know, what presents as intense this way means the other is lacking. What presents intense in the other way means the current piece is lacking and that you get to the in place where they're both intense and amplify or mm -hmm. accent each mm -hmm. one another. So I think there's the, the idea of um, really seriously and intense market difference between two things often is a clue that a catalyst is required to resume the balance in the, in the system. Um, basically tallest blade of grass first to get cut. You know, someone rises too far out, and, you know, they're right off the top. So um, I really like though how clear and simple he makes the, you know, if your dream life is boring, take a look at your ebullience. If yeah. you know, if, you, if you, you're, you're maybe life, striving too high. <laughs> yeah, maybe striving too high and maybe even out of a line for your own alignment of what you're balanced mm -hmm. to be able to do. And then on, on the, you know, the contrapuntal side, the other piece is that if your dream life is really rich, maybe, okay, pour some of that into your life. You know, I take that and understand that you don't have that, you know, banal, boring um, piece. And, and so basically let your own intensities when where they lie, where they are, give you clues as to where you can use your creative drive to, to enhance. So your mm -hmm. own rising tide raises all of your inner ships and outer ships together. Yeah. Right. Up. As a thought. I mean, no, I mean, I think that's, that's fine. The, you know, the key to this essentially is that, um, um, is the idea of compensation that your dreams uh, that Jung felt that your dreams represent a compensation to what is happening in your regular life. And, and so you have to analyze them in sort of that reverse way in order to understand what they mean. Well, and the point you made earlier, you know, if it's like the BF Skinners, the behaviorists, the, the if P then Q, you know, logic of that's just mathematical formalization tables of what someone might do actions, but it's, it's in no way, even mathematics, you know, calculus, yeah. it's more arithmetic. And so even when well, he says illegitimate, when they are either in a mere intellectual curiosity or flight from unpleasant, unpleasant reality. Um, yeah. And right before and, that, the excursions of this kind are legitimate only when they arise from the deepest and truest needs of the individual. And um, last night, my wife and I were watching this special about called Diamond Hands, about um, these guys who figured out that there was a special position in a stock called GameStop. And... Uh, and it was that it was, um, it had been a short sold 140%. In other words, it had been short sold more than existed. <laughs> and, and so they decided to make a move on, on GameStop uh, in, through Reddit. And people caught on to it and they increased the value of the stock by an incredible amount, like from $5 up to uh, even $1,000 at one point. Um, 420 comes into my head, but uh, you know, one of these guys, as an example, put $40,000 in it at $5 a share. And then as it's going up, the people that had sold it short have to cover, okay, in the in the stock market, and so right. they have they have to buy the stock, and then the stock price goes up more, and then there's more people that have to cover, and pretty soon it just goes skyward, and um, and they got uh, 
let, let's put it this way. They got some valuable lessons in how the casino, which is the stock market, works. And um, yeah, that's the air compressor method. Just plug it in and boom, watch right. what I, you know, it's, it's a manipulation rather than an actual move. Right. But they were describing some of the psychological things that were going on over the period that this was going on. And one guy had gotten his investment up to over a million dollars. And then finally, when he did sell out, he only got 350,000. So instead of being happy that he got 350,000, he was sad because he lost the million. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and so uh, what I learned. Well, and that's about- the problem there. That's, that's the difference between a gambler and an investor. Right. Because it's all weather. And I mean, personally, I mean, buy low, buy high, don't sell. It's, you know, daily dollar cost yeah. averaging kind of thing. Yeah, and I, I just, I put my kids through college um, buying uh, stock options, put mm-hmm. some calls. And um, and I did quite well with it. I, obviously, I put my kids through college, so that was quite well. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and um, but but the problem with statistics is there's always the black swan. And so when they're talking about <laughs> things being statistics, um, you know, I'm immediately suspect about it. Um, so it goes to me the black and the white hat. I mean, the lies, the damn lies, and then there's statistics. It's right, like, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And and so that's the fallacy of of these statistical methods yeah. to evaluate evaluate people's psychology. And um, you know, you can ask you can ask a uh, hundred people, will you be happy if I give you a bowl of ice cream? And you can statistically prove that a hundred people will say, yeah, that'd be great. (laughs) right? (laughs) And so psychologically, that's a a statistical fact um, or probably close to it. But, you know, then there's always the ordinary person who who will say, oh, I know what they're trying to pull on me. I'm going to say the opposite. Right. Well, and and that's an example, too, of sample bias which is sure. a skew of when you just, you know, someone says, you know, out of the 500 people we asked, 400, 498 of them said, uh, out of the five, out of these 500, 498 said this. So there's a 98% chance. Well, no one asked the question, how many surveys did you send out? And you find out 50 million. I'm like, you just took a little slice that happened to be like one little gold vein and the rest of it is rock, you know, I mean, yeah. so it's, it's that sample bias is, is. Well, the other thing that was interesting about this film last night was uh, these young people had done all this research where they, you know, figured out that, you know, this guy had been involved. So therefore it's an interesting thing. And Elon Musk mentioned it on Twitter and therefore Zoom, you know, various things like that. And um, and when I did, when I put my kids through college, I, I did something very simple. I never did any research. Um, mm-hmm. I selected uh, companies that I thought were solid companies that wouldn't go bankrupt and decided whether the market in general, and I, I would pick companies like Exxon, okay? I'm not sure Exxon would be a good pick today because um, oil companies are not in favor these days, but um, but I was picking Exxon and just based on my intuition about what's happening in society, I was predicting whether it was, would go up or down. Mm-hmm. And I was hedging. In other words, I would, I would buy a position based on what I thought would happen, but I also b- bought the opposite position in case I was wrong. <laughs> well, right. It's even like placing a limit order, you know. You, so yeah. you're 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 played into a limit orders play into a range. You are then covering yourself 
-hmm. because you know the profit obviously was probably going to account for if not squash out the loss or you know if it didn't then you still had other positions i mean so i mean this kind of like reminds me of the osprey it's uh okay to put all your eggs in one basket if you yeah. control that basket, it's just like, you know, but the thing is, the word control can be kind of tricky. Right. But then, then, uh, you know, I put my life savings backing a business that was going to be supported by Lehman Brothers. And on September 15th, 2005, Lehman Brothers went bankrupt and took my life savings with it. 187 year old investment bank and so you know there's always a black swan (laughs) one time I was in Hawaii and uh, Deb and I were driving around uh, to the let's see it was the uh, I guess I guess it was the east coast of Oahu and there's this pond with a with a hotel next to it and lo and behold there was a whole flock of black swans in the in the (laughs) thing and so I took a picture of it with my uh, cell phone and I immediately texted it uh, to the dean of the business school and I said aha I found that black swans do exist (laughs) 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 okay where are we here Uh, 289, shall I? Yeah, go ahead. Paragraph 289. There are certainly not a few people who were afraid to admit that the unconscious could ever have, in quotes, big ideas. They will object, in quotes, but do you really believe that the unconscious is capable of offering anything like a constructive criticism of our Western mentality? Close quotes. Of course, if we take the problem intellectually, and impute rational intentions to the unconscious, the thing becomes absurd, but it would never do to foist our conscious psychology on the unconscious. Its mentality is an instinctive one. It has no differentiated functions, and it does not, quote unquote, think as we understand, quote unquote, thinking. It simply creates an image that answers to the conscious situation. This image contains as much thought as feeling and is anything rather than a product of rationalistic reflection. Is anything rather than a product of rationalistic reflection. Such an image would be better described as an artist's vision. We tend to forget that a problem like the one which underlies the dream last mentioned cannot, even to the conscious mind of the dreamer, be an intellectual problem, but is profoundly emotional. For a moral man, the ethical problem is a passionate question which has its roots in the deepest instinctual processes, as well as in his most idealistic aspirations. The problem for him is devastatingly real. It is not surprising, therefore, that the answer likewise springs from the depths of his nature. The fact that everyone thinks his psychology is the measure, his thinks his psychology is the measure, measure of all things, and if he also happens to be a fool, will inevitably think that such a problem is beneath his notice should not trouble the psychologist in the least, for he has to take things objectively as he finds them without twisting them to fit his subjective suppositions. The richer and more capacious natures may legitimately be gripped by an impersonal problem. And to the extent that this is so, their unconscious can answer in the same style. And just as the conscious mind can put the question, in quotes, why is there this frightful conflict between good and evil, close quotes, so the conscious, un- so the unconscious can reply, in quotes, look closer. Each needs the other. The best, just because it is the best, holds the seed of evil. And there's nothing so bad, but good can come of it. <laughs> <laughs> so right on. Um, and something struck me right in the middle there what, um, <clears throat> oh um, where, where's the line 
Oh, the, without twisting them to fit his subjective suppositions, where, I mean, that to me calls out the importance of inspecting your expectations. Right, and and further, only the wounded doctor can heal. So the right. the ideas we were talking about earlier, where if the doctor goes through all these horrible places and ex actually experiences those passions, that's how um, he knows what to do. It's not from any statistical thing. Um, right, and. Um, so let's uh, read on because we have a chance of getting to the end of this chapter here in four pages, and that would be a good thing. Uh, if we don't get to the end of it, um, then uh, we'll finish it up next week because I want to definitely finish this chapter before, um, before we take this uh, high lesson. And the next chapter is Animus and Anima. So we need to keep that all together. Um, so, um, but there is nothing so bad, but good can come of it. And so the point is that whatever we see that is horrible today, for example, uh, very easily the Ukraine war, um, one could easily come up with good that can come of it. Uh, just as it was the case that, that as horrible as the war with Germany and Japan was in World War II, they're now our best allies and have been for quite some time, <laughs> you know, for decades. Well, that's, a, that's an excellent point, because also, too, it's just like, you know, never be fooled by the intensity of the negativity of your circumstances, because just like weather, it washes through. So, you know, you, yeah. you don't get all freaked out and manic, you know, about an and, and anxious. It, it's that actually distorts your perspective even further and digs a mm -hmm. hole, drowns you rather than weathering and just, well, get an umbrella. You yeah. know, I mean, I don't want to minimize it, but at the same time, there's um, it washes through. Yeah. Like you said, that these these bad things, good can come of it. Absolutely. And I have plenty of examples of that in my life, but I'm not going to speak of them just Yeah, now. That, we could go okay. along with me. Of a All list. right. So going on, paragraph 290. Uh, Brendan, did you have anything to add? No, thank uh, you. Not at this point. Okay. It might then dawn on the dreamer that the apparently insoluble conflict is perhaps a prejudice, a frame of mind conditioned by time and place. The seemingly complex dream image might easily reveal itself as plain instinctive common sense as the tiny germ of a rational idea, which a mature mind could just as well have thought consciously. At all events, Chinese philosophy thought it ages ago. The singularity, the singularly apt plastic configuration of thought is the prerogative of that primitive natural spirit, which is alive in all of us and is only obscured by a one-sided conscious development. If we consider the unconscious compensation from this angle, we may justifiably be accused of judging the, the unconscious too much from the conscious standpoint. And indeed, in pursuing these reflections, I have always started with the view that the unconscious simply reacts to the conscious contents, albeit in a very significant way, but that it lacks initiative. It is, however, far from my intention to give the impression that the unconscious is merely reactive in all cases. On the contrary, there is a host of experiences which seem to prove that the unconscious is not only spontaneous, but can actually take the lead. There are innumerable cases of people who lingered on in pedophaging unconsciousness, only to become neurotic in the end. Thanks to the neurosis contrived by the unconscious, they are shaken out of their apathy, and this in spite of their own laziness and often desperate resistance. Well, I would say that um, the, the Carl Jung 
character that's in the play, which I'm playing that character, uh, definitely was pedophagging his own um, improper behavior in the early days of Hitler, the early, uh, the early 1930s. And um, he's, he's caught out in this play. And um, the first time we did a reading of it in Aptos last November, we just read the play through at the, with the cast. Um, I wept um, because, um, you know, I have a lot of psychic energy tied up with um, Carl Jung and Carl Jung is in the play and the, in the script is, is admitting to some major faults. And, and I was actually feeling that and, and so on. And, and so it's obvious that he was pedophaging. Now, I think Tim Holmes, who's our director, would love it if I could <laughs> whip up that same reaction for the play on the 12th of June, but uh, probably that's not the case because we've now read the play a couple hundred times. So. Well, and, and to me too, it's, I think it's important for the audience too to define pedophagy. And it's basically an undue focus on petty details. So literally it's creating smoke and mirrors or fogging, a lack of clarity with pettiness. So you're basically a, another way to say pedophagy would be nitpicking. Mm -hmm. And and that's but pedophagy is a little more manipulative and stuck. Right. Okay, so go ahead. Uh, paragraph 291 okay. is it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Paragraph 291. Yet it would, in my view, be wrong to suppose that in such cases the unconscious is working to a deliberate and concerted plan and is striving to realize certain defin definite ends. I have found nothing to support this assumption. The driving force so far as it is possible for us to grasp it seems to be in essence only an urge towards self-realization. If it were a matter of some general teleological plan, then all individuals who enjoy a surplus of unconsciousness would necessarily be driven towards higher consciousness by an irresistible urge. That is plainly not the case. There are vast masses of the population who, despite their notorious unconsciousness, never get anywhere near a neurosis. The few who are smitten by such a fate are really persons of the quote unquote higher type who for one reason or another have remained too long on a primitive level. Their nature does not in the long run tolerate persistence in what is for them an unnatural torpor. As a result, of their narrow conscious outlook and their cramped existence, they save energy, bit by, they save energy. Bit by bit, it accumulate, accumulates in the unconscious and finally explodes in the form of a more or less acute neurosis. This simple mechanism does not necessarily conceal a quote unquote plan. A perfectly understandable urge towards self-realization would provide a quite satisfactory explanation. We could also speak of a retarded maturation of the personality. Right. Well, we certainly have um, lots of examples of that in our political um, debates, our current affairs politics today. Um, and, you know, the, the folks that do have retarded maturation um, you know, are probably pretty set in that retarded maturation. They're very happy to stay there. <laughs> well, and honestly, what's interesting, I, I sometimes make a distinction between my retarded maturation, which um, is would seemingly be almost congenital in a way. Mm -hmm. And they've been taught by pettifogging. You know, they've been taught that they have to choose. They have to decide. You know, you have to pick a side. Well, I agree on picking a side. And especially, you know, if, if you do nothing, the aggressor is amplified. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, there's this competition energy 
which is one of the most negative things that can happen because it's comparison. Not I won, I lost. The I am, you know, holier than now. The self, it creates a self-righteousness instead of learning how to exceed your own limits and help each other develop higher limits. The win-loss quotient, you know, I think in politics is um, focuses too much on a fact structure. And a fact structure is just a structure. I mean, it's it's damn lies. Jordan, you know, because you're high. I'm rather offended by your uh, terminology and, um, well, not yours, just as Skip as well. And I, I haven't really been paying close attention, so I might have missed the point completely. Um, but the retarded maturation, is that somebody who, because of various trauma in their lives, have remained, let's say, um, as a teenager in terms of their understanding of such and such concept, or they've, they've retained the understanding of a seven-year-old when it comes to, um, I don't know, parental attachment or something. Is that what you're talking about? I think actually at the base, that's what Jung is mentioning. And I mm -hmm. think I, I would have been better to bring that up directly. Um, because I think there's there's the the layman's misinterpretation of retarded maturation, which means oh someone was born with it they, they're retarded in their maturation. Whereas the reality is those trauma that you you know so aptly just brought up, that's what's the crippling thing holding back. In you know if someone is going along saying all these things and all of a sudden they sound like they're seven, you're like well what what just happened there? And it's because that trauma is speaking and that's holding. And, and this is exactly. This is what many of us who have suffered trauma, many of us, um, uh, many of us act out of our PTSD. Right. But many of us, many of us, when we are experiencing um, a situation that reminds us, um, if we're not in a good, healthy place, um, then our PTSD is what makes decisions for us. And yes, it's immature. Yes, it's um it's um it's in, in retardation it's not behaving like the 62 year old adult that i should behave in when i um follow one particular thought pattern or a sense of feeling or belief or whatever but well i i don't i don't think the trauma is actually what he's talking about here i mean he he talked about people being at sort of every stage of the human psyche for the last 10,000 years, let's say. And so you meet people on the street that have, have matured in a certain way. They've brought up, been brought up in a certain family. And, you know, if you investigated these various people, some of them would be like Victorians and some of them would be like early 20th century people and others would be um, like people after certain experiences like the wars. And, um, and I don't think that the trauma is what he's getting at here is, but rather um, the maturity of the individual or the cul-de-sac of individuals, let's say, um, you know, there are a lot of groups that reinforce your bad ideas. Right? Indeed. Well, right. indeed. And I, I also think I, I see the black and the white hat. I have to fully resonate and agree with both of you because, Skip, you're talking on a general level. Yeah. And then Brendan is speaking in an actual how to heal it level and what's actually occurring. I mean, yeah. even... In psychology, well, in, yeah, where a my, part takes over, yeah, someone has a manager part, and it jumps up. It's impenetrable. It's a ninja. You, you if you don't have a handle on it, it's going to speak for you, and that's the trauma. Well, and, and it's it, directly and it a part that's speaking. Right, it does. And um, you know, tomorrow we're going to have the blue angels go by here, and uh, a lot of helicopters. And there have been a lot of helicopters the last couple of days because of. This is graduation week at the Naval Academy, and um, you know. So I do have a limited PTSD related to the sound of 
jet planes and helicopters, especially helicopters, and also fireworks, the 4th of July. Mm -hmm. And, but, and they do put me back. I mean, they put me back in a different place. In other words, uh, if I'm outside and fireworks are going on so I can smell the cordite and all that, um, man, I do flashback to Vietnam. And, mm -hmm. and the same with helicopters. It was happening to it today, to me today. But, and it doesn't get better. But what I do know is that I now recognize it and know that it happens. And therefore, I can say, oh, okay, there's my PTSD for that. Well, and then you're, a, you're able to put a fence on it. And then yeah. Brendan's talking about the when it's healed in a way. And I, Brendan opened out, you know, the offended at, and I, I, I want to speak directly to that because that gave me quite an insight as to just to the word retarded maturation. I think what we should do is drain out the shaming behavior juice from the yeah, I, I, I think word. this is a poor selection of words on Jung's part, very honestly, Breton. And, and mm -hmm. I, I'm sympathetic with your yeah. um, with with your reaction to it because this was written a hundred years ago. Yeah, it's taking on a different meaning now. Yeah, exactly. and he's being overly scientific too, which is dispassionate, which then is not empathic. So yeah, yeah this was long before he did most of his research and experience um so i mean i in that in that way i think we can take this whole book at, with a grain of salt right yeah and right i have argued with myself whether it makes sense to even continue this book because it, because it was written so long ago that it um you know, in some ways, Jung was a male chauvinist, uh, but that's yes. what that's what men were uh, back yeah, at the end of the 19th century. And, yeah, I agree. And that's so true. he was a man of his time, but it doesn't mean that his insights aren't still valuable to us in other ways. Uh, you know, he's, you know, if if we had to meet him today, we probably wouldn't like him. I wouldn't like him. I know yeah. that. Okay. Well, you know, and I, I read him, I read him like a snake under a partial molt. You know, there's there, if I read it conceptually, then all of the words that are hundred years old and not appropriate now just peel away. But I have to read it conceptually. I think that's where to me it's valuable. But if I re read it as if I was trying to learn a chapter and verse, I'm not going to imitate it. I'm going to use the concepts, but the wording has specifically completely different implications now that's for yeah. sure surely uh so um i don't know have we have we addressed your offense brendan or if I think, not? yeah I, I i think so mostly you know it is very true what you say that um if people are suffering often they look for other people that will give them comfort and um if you're acting out of a, um, an, imma an immaturity in one aspect of your life, you often find a bunch of people who find your immaturity um, comforting, amusing, um, uh, something that they enjoy. Well, or often, they get paid for it. I, yeah. You know, I, often this happens in families. You know, this, oh, well, that's just how he behaves. Or, you know, you've, yeah. you quickly... Um, sink to a level that suits your immaturity, um, immature behavior. This is why groups of yobs and thugs hang together and football. I mean, that's, that's where they, um, that immaturity, the inability to empathize, um, the, that those people enjoy each other's company. Mm -hmm. I think it's for us to do that, set that thing all the time is, you know, the examined life is difficult and the unexamined life is, you know, you know not that good either. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, what I say it's keep doing the work, keep doing the work, keep being aware of who you are and um, and working to be your best self. 
You know, I, I'm in full agreement. I, I think there's a wonderful quote that if you don't heal inside what's hurt, you will bleed on those who don't hurt you, mm -hmm. or who haven't hurt you. And that's when, you know, the trauma trigger comes out and, you know, you get into a, an argument with someone because they reminded you of that trauma and, and put you in. But instead of templating on them, you realize you come to a point to realize if you're getting stirred up, they're just reminding you of why you were naturally stirred up in that particular piece inside, which there's your trauma presenting, but yeah. healing it yourself instead of, you know, bleeding on other people who didn't hurt you. I was challenged all today and I don't know why about that. Um, and I had to keep reminding myself to be present, asking myself, why am I reacting to this in this way? And um, where am I? Am I present? Am I, you know, um, so yeah, mindfulness, as somebody said, mindfulness is hard work. That's why it works. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Jung said, uh, thinking is difficult. That's why most people judge. Yeah. Uh, and Susan in the chat made a, basically a comment as to, you know, he was, he wasn't very patient with people in their retarded, um, maturation yeah. where he, he, he was, so he, I wouldn't call him self-righteous, but he sure was high and mighty about it. Yeah, and so when when I read retarded maturation, what I read is a secret society where um, you get into a, a group and everybody thinks the same thing about certain things. Yes. And therefore, mm -hmm. um, you're reinforced in your own stupidity, right? And yeah. So I just want to... Um, and you brought up the cul-de-sac. I think that really fits. Yeah, that. so, so I want to read a paragraph from Memory Streams Reflections about secret societies. Okay. And so, so these this applies not only to the Masons and the B'nai B'rith and, and so on, but also to, um, uh, you know, these, these gun cults that we have running around the United States and including the one that sent the young man up to Buffalo um, recently, whether it was yeah, done by, you know, actively by another person or it just was, he watched enough videos and then that, then off he went. Uh, I, I don't think that's a distinction without a difference. Um, but but he wasn't even 20, right? Yeah, he wasn't even 20. So he doesn't have uh, enough experience to evaluate and so um i'll just read this paragraph because it it really sums it up the secret society is an intermediary stage on the way to individuation the individual is still relying on a collective organization to affect his differentiation for him that is and so example would be you join the Masons and then that makes you different from society. And so then you think you're good, but that's not necessarily the truth. Um, so, and that is, he has not yet recognized that it is really the individual's task to differentiate himself from all the others and stand on his own feet. All collective identities, such as membership in organizations, support of isms and so on interfere with the fulfillment of this task okay so i'll apply it to the marines and lots of other things right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. such collective identities are crutches for the lame shields for the timid beds for the lazy nurseries for the irresponsible but they are equally shelters for the poor and weak a home port for the shipwrecked the bosom of a family for orphans, a land of promise for disillusioned vagrants and weary pilgrims, a herd and a safe fold for lost sheep and a mother providing nourishment and growth. It would therefore be wrong to regard this intermediary stage as a trap on the contrary for a long time to come. It will represent the only possible form of existence for the individual who nowadays seems more than ever threatened 
by anonymity. Collective organization is still so essential today that many consider it with some justification to be the final goal, whereas to call for further steps along the road to autonomy appears like arrogance or hubris, fantasticality, or simply folly. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. It's a description I, I, of it's a description certainly of the Catholic Church and I would argue any church. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. We just yeah. had uh, the reason I'm wearing a nice rich red tie is we had confirmation this evening. We had 35 kids confirmed in their 16-year-old adolescent faith. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, very nicely the bishop his name is Adam Parker youngish guy he said unless you have your own he didn't use he, he said this word unless you have your own individual relationship with jesus christ you're going to find membership in this church very difficult which is interesting because um you know it's often thought that you don't really need to have a relationship with the godhead you just you know, come pay your money and all that kind. We'll take care of everything else. So it's an interesting switch this young bishop is talking about, uh, that you do need to have that individuation if you wish right. and, to be and, a, a fully active member of the church. Right. And Jung is taking even a step further than that by saying that that you actually have to be Christified. You have to become like Christ mm -hmm. uh, and, and, uh, and suffer in the same ways that Christ did. Now, so, you know, I say to myself, well, geez, uh, crucifixion doesn't sound too attractive. No. But, uh, yeah. but the reality is, you know, life is tough and yes. you're, you're going to have a lot of problems in life. And you need to address them in a, in a very human way. And, um, you know, there's a spectrum, which is represented by Christ and the Buddha. Christ being the end of the spectrum where uh, you accept, you know, your sacrifice. You're going to make a sacrifice in certain ways. In certain ways, this YouTube channel is a sacrifice mm -hmm. that I that I make that I choose to make every Monday, and I, we'll see. I fortunately we got a nice compliment tonight, so maybe I'll keep sacrificing. Um, but you know, very honestly, uh, after next week, we will have completed six years of this YouTube channel or of my reading group, and. And I'm asking myself, well, is that enough? Should we quit or keep going? And so the indication tonight from, from Zen Mode is maybe we should keep going because it does help people. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, especially uh, what Jordan and I have been doing on Sunday morning has really uh, kind of taken off in a in an amazing way. I mean, YouTube says that if people, if the average number of minutes that a pe people listen is over 10 minutes, uh, you're doing very well. Um, and on yesterday's session that Jordan and I did, we had uh, an average of 16 and a half minutes. Uh, and- This is a lot. I mean, yeah, what that's do you guys a lot. do. What do you do yeah. on Sunday morning? Well, we've been uh, we've been reading and commenting on Answer to Job. That's mm -hmm. a, basically it, and mm -hmm. with an intention to uh, perhaps at the end of Answer to Job, we've got a long way to go because we're still in an early part of it. But um, uh, doing uh, the Red Book because the Red Book is beyond a lot of people. Yeah. Um, and yeah. um, and you know I, I I have read the the red book on this YouTube channel cover to cover, mm -hmm. and and so there's nobody can doubt that I 
have read the red book right because i did it on video <laughs> but, well right right that's <laughs> i um it's interesting while you were reading the the piece on secret societies to then kind of extend take an off road from retarded maturation to have a more robust example which that certainly is um i wrote down secret societies are similar to tidal pools rather than the ocean very limited in their world view of what the world even is because their horizon they, is just but they may have a pool. the oceans right over there and they don't see it at all right but um Susan asks a question, is NATO an example of a collective identity? I want to make sure my mind is tracking correctly. And the answer to that is, um, yes, it, sur it surely is. And, um, you know, it, you know, you, societies grapple with bigger and bigger problems and bigger and bigger giants that they have to deal with. Mm -hmm. And, and so all of a sudden uh, people in Sweden and Finland see how Mariupol got destroyed by the Russians. And they say, wow, we don't want that to happen here. So let's, let's get into NATO. Well, that's a collective I identity. And, um, you know, it's, it's needed. And, um, you know, in point of fact, um, you know, nation states can't, don't have the strength unless they're very large to fend off somebody like Russia or China uh, without, you know, joining with others, but. Yeah. Know, and but, NATO then is, it's, um, it's, it's kind of the positive example of the urban designers joke of, NIMBYs and um, Nuffle, which is not on my front lawn or not in my backyard. Yeah. And, but they see that and so NATO is a proactive way for, yeah, it is a collective identity. Um, I hadn't thought about it that way, but that's... Um, well, surely it is because mm -hmm. by joining NATO, then you cross the line. And once Putin crosses that line, then he's engaged the whole collective not right. only not only a small country and you know stalin tried to tried to attack finland in 1939 i believe and uh i think there was a finally a settlement but both sweden and finland um def have defended themselves but have also stayed neutral over hundreds of, of years and but now the the issues have gotten too big and so they mm -hmm. they can't do it anymore you have to realize that you know um you know the okay i'm a marine i'm a rough tough nail biting a uh, nail nail chewing marine um uh, what do we say? Uh, an oversexed, underpaid killer, <laughs> right? But, but, um, you know, some. <laughs> I can imagine a time where I might call out my fellow Marines and say, "Look, something's bigger than I am, and I need your help." Mm -hmm. And and I would probably get a lot of people to rally to that call. Um, well, NATO is also, it, it's a stopgap to that pedophogging. Instead of people just having neighbor to neighbor conflict and war all the time, and which is pretty much a feudal system, you know, mm -hmm. going back to that, it creates a stopgap of a pause of reflection of, oh, well, if I do this, they're going to come kick my ass. The big, you know, the big whole thing, yeah. you know, and so that I hate to say it that way, but in a sense, it's like it's a shame that the church is the one who got a hold of morals and ethics, because um, the, that's that title pool again. And NATO, though, does at least provide a pause so that typically, unlike now, I mean, Russia wasn't part of, but um, there's a pause before people do attack. So they have to come, kind of come to the conference room, literally have kind of have to come to the table before they can, you know, take the safety off and pull the trigger, which 
And that's, I mean, that's the intent of NATO, you mm -hmm. know, to bring the countries together for at least discussion of problems rather than, you know, oh, let's just go fight. You know, I mean, it's yeah. we're just kind of petty. Well, and, you know, in the end, human beings will be all one thing or we will be dead. Okay, there won't be a species anymore. Um, this was Edward Edinger's observation that, you know, ultimately what is going to happen is that humanity will have to all work together and find a way to do this or we will destroy ourselves. And we can do that any day of the week now. So it's a question of how, how do we keep from doing it? Um, well, and that to me is what's so important about the integrity of keeping the dignity and difference between people instead of the, the casual murder called the melting pot, which, you know, numbs everything out into mud. Um, all the cultural distinctions and beauties and nuances lost, then, you know, we don't all want to be the same, but it's the kind of thing where, oh, I'm different like everyone else. And I mean, that kind of thing. Well, and, and the point is we can be different and live together and yes. respect certain values together. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, notwithstanding the mental health of certain leader. Okay. Or and couple, I think that just circles right back leaders. to that. That's circles back to the maturation where if someone's, you know, like for example, Brendan has brought up, you know, counseling and such. Well, there's an, a consciousness there. So in a sense, just even the action of doing that is a mature thing. And so it's not about any of us ever gets completely all the way to Nirvana. I mean, kind of thing, but um, that when people are unthreatened, you know, when they're self-aware, they also, they know their faults. They know that, and you're not, a, you're not infallible, but there's a certain maturity to being unthreatened and, then that also, frankly, makes some of the funniest things pop out of people that, that are literally, you know, humor. Um, yeah. Okay, I'm going to call it a quits here because we're not going to get through four more pages. And, um, and I, but we have to next week in order to f finish up this part of the book. Yeah. So that, okay. so that we'll tee, tee up Adam and that Adam Animus after the confluence break but um but i think we've had a good discussion tonight which gives people a lot of people food for thought and um and so thank you susan and so um so i think we ought to just leave it at that as as fodder to be chewed upon and uh and brendan, brendan thanks for taking yeah. events and stepping yeah. up with that absolutely that, absolutely that was a wonderful place to actually in a sense we were off track in a way and no, we you, were you, you were i mean you were being anachronistic I and mean, that's the nature of the book you're the book is yeah, 100 that's, years that's, old that's, and uh, it's like you know reading the king james bible i'm you know there's there's a bunch of stuff in that book that offends me right yeah. Well, there's there's plenty that offends me and there's plenty that offends me in Jung's work. But at the same time, uh, I find more and more that as I read the Red Book sentence by sentence and really let it sink in, um, it, it's just it truly is. Um, a sacred text. Yes, in many ways. And uh, let's see. I do have. I think I have one quote here, but I'm not sure. I have it in this pile. But let me just quick it. Quickly Skip. Quickly it's quickly. it's a mystical text like the Bhagavad Gita. Absolutely. Yeah, there, yeah. you got it. And I think that that takes me back to my, you know, snake and partial malt, 
to try to read if I, I start finding like I'm flying through a flak field and you know the belly of the plane's just getting taken out I'll move up a little higher and just play the concept game where are, are there concepts here that have become ingredients for something to put together instead of no 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 I don't follow your geometric proof that's not the you know basically that's the the statistics or the damn wise part. Um, yeah. um, I actually don't have the quote here, but because uh, I, I have it in a completed bookmark, but um, okay. uh, I'll just leave it at that for now. Um, but we might, uh, you know, I've often thought that with uh, with Red Book, you could just take it a sentence at a time. But what I really found out when it first came out, somebody was reading the Bible mm -hmm. or somebody was entering onto Twitter the Bible verse by verse. Mm -hmm. And I said, mm -hmm. okay, well, let me see. I, I, maybe I could do something like that with the Red Book. And I could take it uh, one paragraph at a time but of course on twitter especially at that time you could only get i think it was 120 <laughs> 70 70 characters yeah 120 characters something and um and so you you could only take it one sentence at a time and so i decided to take it one paragraph at a time mm. and which meant that i had to put the sentences in in reverse <laughs> <laughs> reverse order so that w when somebody found it later they would be able to read down and read it in the correct <laughs> order but what i found out was that it makes ac absolutely as much sense forward Back as backward mm -hmm. you could read it backwards and it'll, uh, mean, it'll i remember the whole you know when twitter was you know first out it, the whole notion of you know people are like good people will be concise and i'm like no no, no this is pedophagy it's going to be worse because people are going to just cut these little, it's going to be a death by a thousand cuts every single day. You know? Right. But so I, to me, I like Twitter. I mean, I'm not, I a, I, I'm not an enemy of Twitter because I've done a lot of things with it and moved a lot of things with it. Um, yeah. I'm no enemy of it at all. I just, I just left and, it at the time as a time sink there's only so many social platforms that i had to rain down to you know x number of minutes per day period or you get lost in there oh yeah and and so um for me twitter is like the collective unconscious right it, it's like the collective unconscious manifest yeah you, you can see yeah it's what, like aerial view from space and it's yeah. like <laughs> Okay, so but, you know, we will continue see from on, space? on the volcanoes. Page... Pardon? What can we see from space? The volcanoes erupting, the Great Wall of China, and don't forget that anyone you know probably has a crush on Zelensky because from space we can see his balls. So... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but... <laughs> Uh, I saw that a couple weeks ago. It's like the things you can see from space. Don't be fooled that your girlfriend doesn't have a crush on uh, Zelensky because you can see the Great Wall of China. Hasn't she told you she wants to go on vacation? She sees the volcanoes erupting. That's really cool. Guess what else she could see? <laughs> so <laughs> there you go. Anyway. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, I'm getting into that. Uh, into that mega fagging oh okay. let me spell Can this for you spell the word it sounds yeah. like mega fogging it's petty fogging i believe but here you go uh, for me so yeah I put, I put it in there in the chat uh, it's a strange word it, it kind of self-defines but then even when you know what it means you kind of go well, it's kind of clouded in its own definition yeah so she susan says i don't have the text well actually Susan, the, you can have the text one minute from now because on the uh, Dropbox, on the Dropbox, the Carl Jung Deaf Psychology Dropbox, under Collected Works, you can find every volume of the Collected Works of C.G. Jung.
including this one, and you can download it and you'll have an electronic version of it. Um, I happen to have a paper version of it because my way of my way of meditation is to underline books. Okay, like, or now I also put tabs on books. Um, and it doesn't seem to help anyone. <laughs> then, then you get something like, like this. Yeah. I <laughs> And you say, okay, what did that tab mean? Then you have to still go back through all the tabs. Um, but well, anyway. actually, I, I'm, I'm liking the idea of the Red Book more and more because I know when I first saw it, um, I just started going through it, reading it as a visual story. Like it was one giant tarot deck. Mm -hmm. And um, notwithstanding any of his intent, just to see what story, like Grimm's Fairy Tales visually. And mm -hmm. I think between the two of us, you know, we both have the handle on the text and the imagery that it could be a nice interplay going through because it's so rich and robust. Yeah. Well, Jordan Peterson, now I'll just finish up because uh, he's a public figure now. Um, today, he sent out his notice of, of things to know. So he took the position that if your spouse strays one time, then basically that's the end. He, he says he doesn't <clears throat> see how that's recoverable. And, um, you know, as a result of that, and as a result of that kind of advice, which has been coming to, especially to women over the last half of the 20th century, um, we have, 50% divorces because people think that this is is black and white, but it, it's not. And uh, I, I think it's really stupid to give, to give people that kind of psychological advice to say, this, yes. this mm -hmm. is a hard and fast rule. Black and white. Um, and, um, and the and, other, and go ahead, Jordan. I, I was gonna say too, I've noticed, I there are a couple of things, I guess, on Instagram where, you know, he's featured here and there lately a lot more. And um, I haven't looked to see if how current, but if he's still on this all meat diet, you know, his eyes have darkened. He's got this more of an aggressive tone. Uh, he feels angry and kind of sparky. I think he, it feels like the volcano is kind of pressurizing up again. And I, I'm wondering if he's going to break again. Um, because it's just watching him, the nonverbals, just the leer and the gaze and the glare is just so, um, it, it feels a little like Putin. I mean, you get a, you get an aggressive, almost predatorial um, nothingness, but that it's just, wow, this is just about to be teeth. So I'm kind of wondering if he's going to erupt. Could be. Um... And he's done such good work in some places, but I, I don't know. I still can't get around. I, I call him the Jungian disco ball. I don't know what's on the sur substance inside, but he just has all these little glass quotes right. that all shine off in different directions. But it feels right. like he's kind of coming to his own right. ideas again. And he's and getting it, really pissed. Well, no, he's not because he's quoting Jung. And he's, say, he's said things in his notice tonight. He, he has a competing program on monday night right right right. and so so i get the notices for his competing program every week and so tonight he's not referring to anybody but young and and young's advice was assuredly not that you have to be you know you have to have um you know, loyalty to your spouse, or that's the end. I mean, Carl Jung lived in a menage a trois openly for, for 40, 40 years. Yeah, 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody knew it, and everybody knows it now. <laughs> well, and I think what's interesting is even back, harkening back to the whole Bill Clinton, Monica Lewinsky, quote unquote, scandal, um, the French prime minister at the time said, oh my. 
all this shame and behavior and guilt, you Americans are a culture of sexual prudes. Here in France, we would run a successful campaign on that because it would show how virile we are. <laughs> it's like, it's right. so, you know, well, we're, it's we're, just... we're a country that was found, founded by Puritans. What can I tell you? Um, yeah. And, well, um, what's the old what's the old quote, um, Queen Victoria? You know, when um, here's the thing: the first, the second word, when succumbing to marital sex, as if even then it's still bad. You know, when succumbing to marital sex, marital sex, just lie back and think about the queen. I, I'm like, no, Victoria as didn't if they say have that. To wait a minute, wait a minute. It's, Victoria didn't say that. I mean, literally in her diary, she said. Wow, there's something better than um, I don't know what her what she thought was ice cream. Better, ice cream. So ice cream. Something better than yeah, ice right. cream or something like well, that. Well, maybe that quote. Maybe that quote's just made up. But it's right like because I have I have read. Age. Yeah, I have read uh, Victoria's um, journal. Okay, and. Uh, it's very interesting. The movie Young Victoria actually chronicles the main events of that journal. It's very interesting to read her perspective of it. But, you know, she she was assuredly not a prude. <laughs> yeah, she, so I think that it's probably a misquote just attributed to the Victorian age as someone just supplanted on top of her and it's not hers. Well, and people, yeah, people... You know, projected out on the Victorian age because my two grandmothers were both Victorian women. They were both born in the 19th century, and yet both of them had uh, had abortions. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, they they had five. My mother told me on her deathbed that my grandmothers had five abortions between them, mm -hmm. and yet they raised. They both raised three healthy children who are my um, aunts and uncles today um actually i think they're all i think they're all dead now but but um you know my cousins are certainly around from mm -hmm. those from those women and um you know well i'm i'm glad brendan brought up ice cream because I, I finally somebody else if we're ever in the car together you'll get it and finally the first person, every time I'm driving anywhere and drive by Victoria's Secret, I'll go, oh, it's ice cream. That's our secret. And <laughs> and people will look at me like I have, you know, two heads and no one's ever. So when you said ice cream, I just laugh because I believe I, that's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Every time I go in Victoria's Secret, it's not the, the you know, she's hiding something with lingerie. I'm like, it's Victoria's Secret. That's not the store plural. That That's her secret is it's ice cream. That's it. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's her secret and everyone just looks at me. i think one person got it once but when they did then they just looked at me like that wasn't very funny <laughs> so <laughs> well uh, what we know about victoria is that she had nine children yeah so she was yeah. not a prude no. uh, and i guess everybody all the crown heads of europe are now descended from her yeah <laughs> so Probably a lot of us are too, in one way or another. Yeah, uh, my, mm. my my father said that everybody in the Western world is descended from Alexander the Great, and I don't doubt it. <laughs> yeah, him or Genghis Khan, you know. It's well, like, <laughs> yeah, Genghis Khan. Uh, at least I have three grandchildren that might have Genghis Khan blood in them, mm. uh, but. Uh, Ah, let's see. But thanks. I, okay, I I got to wrap it up here. So yeah. thanks for being thanks, here guys. tonight. See you. Thank you. See you next week. Okay. Thanks, Skip. Bye bye. Take care.